Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We are physicians and professors at Yale University. We're trying to get closer to the truth about health and health care. This week, we'll be speaking with Josh Jabal. But first, we'd like to check in on current or hot topics in health and health care. And Harlan, what's got your attention this week? One quick thing before we get started. I just want to do a shout out to Akiko Osaki. My friend, colleague, your friend, colleague, who uh, just won the Elise Kroner Friendesis, I don't know, Prize for Medical Research, but it's one of the most prestigious honors of its kind. She was awarded for her groundbreaking contributions in the areas of diseases of worldwide significance. And it comes with uh, with really funding to help her continue her great work. But anyway, I just want to take a moment, she, former guest uh, and very good friend of ours, and uh, it just was terrific. We're so happy. Yeah, to throw a throwback to episode 19, uh, about 15 <laughs> months ago when we had her on. We'll have to have her come on. We'll again have to have her come back. But this yeah. terrific acknowledgement of wonderful work she's done. She's amazing. Well, how I remember when we used to get on every week and all we would talk about is COVID, COVID, yes, COVID. I well, do. Can you believe that we're, <laughs> I don't want to say we're at the end of the pandemic. I actually don't think we're at the end of the pandemic, but from for all politicians yeah. and for all intents and purposes, we are calling it the end of, let me call it the end of this phase yeah. of the pandemic. And, you know, for us locally, what's the big thing? The hospital is allowing people to take off the masks in the clinical care area. Yep, exactly. That, that's like a huge deal. We may have been one of the last to to maintain that restriction. And uh, I think everyone's celebrating that uh, they feel like it's a little bit back to normal. In fact, I will tell you, Harlan, I just came from an event where the governor spoke at her hospital with, uh, and I know you were invited to it, but you're you're out of town today. Uh, but I just came from that event. I didn't, where, get an invita- uh, didn't get an invitation. That is not Howie. true. That is not true. And they literally mentioned your name as being <laughs> one of the leaders for the reopen. And then they should have sent me an invitation. Harlan, they invited you. <laughs> Um, but anyway, it was, it, okay. it really was anyone celebrated. listening who was in charge of the invite. It was a huge event. <laughs> go and, ahead, go uh, ahead, go it ahead. was a huge event no. and they did celebrate you as well as the quote end of this phase of the pandemic. Well, that's nice. That really is nice. And as you know, I'm in London right now. So I, 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 I if I had been invited, I would not have been able to attend, but, but anyway, I wanted to start off by this, by saying, I remember we were talking about every week. It seemed like the major thing going on. It was the major thing going on in the world. So what are we talking about? Like, what am I engaged in discussions with now every week? It's these LLMs, these large language models, the, the chat GPT-4. You know, I was just in some discussions today. It's fascinating. You know, people are trying to figure out where does this exactly fit into medicine, the, the topic of this podcast, right? Where does it exactly fit? People are thinking more broadly, of course, but for us, where does it fit in medicine? Do you need to build models that are built specifically on medical data or can you use these broad-based models that are built on all sorts of different inputs that seemingly are able to produce answers that, that are quite sophisticated in the medical realm? So, for example, the testing of it with regard to medical boards. When, when the yeah. chat GPT-4 can pass the medical boards, it wasn't trained. And just for people listening, these artificial intelligence models begin by, by being trained. And, and you know, they, they, in other words, you take a whole bunch of data and you teach it. And then it, it learns. I'm saying in a way as if they're humans, but they, they learn. And the question is sort of what, what do they learn on? And, and uh, without being specifically trained on medical data, they seem to do very well. Yeah. But other people think if you want to optimize them, you need to really reinforce the amount of medical information. And then even other people think if you start feeding it EHR data, the electronic health record data, they're actually going to do worse because there's so much misbehavior and misinformation within the electronic health record that it actually could teach it bad habits, the kind of habits that we see sometimes. Here's what I wanted to ask you, Howie. So I'm here uh, for a British Medical Journal editorial advisory meeting. I'm privileged enough to be on this advisory committee for them and and to be able to hear what they think are the issues they're facing in medical publishing and in scholarship. But we're debating a topic. The topic is that medical journals should ban the use of chat GPT of course, I'm on the side of that's impossible, and I'm against that, it's impossible. that resolution. But it's just interesting that there. And by the way, part of this is for entertainment value, it's kind of just getting a controversial sure. topic, provoking. Yeah, but yeah. I do think that that in academia and in medical journals, I just a person you and I both respect told me this week that he had some data. He primed the the Chat GPT, and he said, "Write me an article." 
and bam, there, there were, it was, he said it was 80% wow. to where he wanted it to be based on just feeding wow. it in. And of course it was the methods and results. It didn't make up anything, but, but it was just produce the article. And, and so what, do, what responsibility do we have to acknowledge that, talk about that? Anyway, it's, it's, it's a fascinating world that way. No, and I, uh, you know, I, I heard just last week that there is a company called um, Chegg. I'm just looking it up right now, but there's a company called Chegg that had its stock plunge 48% last week. That company helps children do their homework. Like it, it assists them, yeah. it tutors them. It's got lots of uses, apparently. I have no knowledge of it outside of what I read, but like, these things will change the world, whether we want to or not. The question is, how do we help create guidelines and how do we help people use it for good, not evil? Yeah, yeah. And you know about these hallucinations, right, Howie? Oh, in, in chat GPT. Yeah. Mean, so right? that's what that's what people yeah. are calling this when chat GPT yeah. makes up it stuff. Makes things up. Makes things up. Yeah. So Crazy. sometimes it, it, sometimes you'll you'll see a fact in chat GPT and you'll say, give me some references. They will give you what appear to be legitimate reference. I mean, they're formatted correctly. They make sense. You would think they're real, but when you look, they don't exist. It's a hallucination by exactly. the AI machine. Exactly. I'll just take one last thing real quick, which is that somebody told me that they were just querying it and said, you know, that Rutherford had this very famous lab in, in physics that, that spawned many Nobel laureates afterwards. Uh, Richard Siever was telling me this and that uh, what was asked, how many laureates were, you know, came out of Rutherford's lab or, you know, this is early, of course, in, in the uh, 20th century. And they, it said eight. And but and then some back said and they were queried back, said, no, no, the correct answer is six. Chat GPT said, yeah, but it should have been eight. The two who didn't get it deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> it's learned how how humans confabulate when they have to. Yep. It's anyway, it's it's a uh, it, it's a new world. It's a new world. So and, and this is likely to be a hot topic for a long time. I'll try not to take all of our space on this, but, uh, and a teaser for next week, we have a paper coming out that it's one of my most important papers. I'm eager to share it with you next week. So I, I promise to get off Great. this topic at least for a week, but let's get on to our guest, Great. a terrific guest today. Josh Jabal is Yale senior associate provost for entrepreneurship and innovation. In this position, he has worked to connect Yale's research to entrepreneurial partners in the community and industry. Prior to joining Yale Ventures in 2022, he served as the chief operating officer from 2020 uh, and the commissioner of the Department of Administrative Services from 2019 for the great state of Connecticut. In this position, Jabal led Connecticut's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and was responsible for 25 state agencies encompassing 30,000 employees. Prior to his public service, Jabal worked for IBM and served as the CEO of Core Informatics. Core Informatics provided data management services to pharmaceutical and other scientific industries before it was acquired by Thermo Fisher Scientific, a Fortune 500 company. Jabal holds a bachelor's degree from Yale College from 97 and an MBA from the Yale School of Management in 2002. So first of all, I want to just welcome you to the podcast, but it's really unusual that we're doing a podcast with someone that I just saw an hour ago. Um, and the reason why I saw you is because our governor uh, met with the senior leadership of our hospital and the senior leadership of the state, including your successors, to talk about the response to the pandemic and announcing how much we're at the point of ending the pandemic emergency right now. Uh, and he called you out specifically because you had such a central role uh, to play in that. And I just wonder if you give our listeners a little bit of a taste of what it was and like. You know, Josh, I wasn't invited to this thing. I just want to tell you. We have discussed this ad nauseum. He was invited. He doesn't read all his emails. Um, okay. But, but I want to hear you tell us a little more about um, what it was like from beginning to end to play that key role at such a stressful time. And there were a lot of moments that were stressful. Uh, there were. Well, first of all, I just want to say, Howie Harlan, thank you for the invitation. I'm a regular listener to the pod. It's a, it's a great program, so <laughs> I'm honored you. to be on. Um, you know, I think it, it, to your point about the COVID uh, response, it was, uh, yeah, an experience. Uh, like, hopefully none will ever go through again, but it was... 
a time where I think we got to see, um, you know, obviously so much struggle, so much, ch so many challenges, but also, you know, in that position to be able to see the state come together actually in ways to solve problems that we'd never faced before and, and to work together to try to do the best we could with what we had at the time. And, um, you know, in particular, you know, Governor Lamont and his leadership and, and his willingness to make tough calls and tough decisions that ultimately, I think now with the benefit of hindsight, look even better than they did at the time, um, you know, were, were, was really, you know, it was an honor to be part of that team. I, I wanted to just pivot here to, to Yale Ventures. And, and so can you tell us a little more about Yale Ventures and, and how it supports Yale innovators and what really sets apart what we're doing here with regard to entrepreneurship and, and innovation? From, from things that may be going on in other places? Sure. So, you know, as you mentioned, Yale Ventures now just over a year old um, is Yale's home for all things entrepreneurship and innovation. So we run a variety of, of programs and, and centers and services that support both faculty as well as students who are looking to solve the big challenges that we're facing in the world today. And so those programs typically take the form of what we call accelerators. So programs that bring in, you know, either faculty or students who have an idea who, in the case of faculty, are doing research um, and have discovered something and are they could have potential to have a real world impact on on solving the problem that they're working on. And we work with them to help uh, develop that technology, get it uh, licensed out, uh, form oftentimes a startup company around it that can scale it up and develop it, or find a corporate partner in the private sector who can take the technology and run with it. But it's really about trying to take that next step from the lab uh, out into the world where technologies can be scaled and, and can have as much of an impact, positive impact in the world as possible. And then, of course, with our students, we run an entrepreneurship center called Sci City that helps them think about how to solve problems in innovative ways, in some cases, start companies as well. So it's an incredibly uh, fun uh, role. We get to meet new people every day working on some of the most cutting edge research. Uh, so it's it's incredibly fun, but it's it's timely, too. There's such demand for what we're doing as well. And, and Yale ends up becoming um, the promoter in some ways of real products. It's not just the research that comes out of this, it's the products. And I know I'm looking over your shoulder, our, our listeners obviously won't see this, but you have products lined up on uh, on your shelf over there. And I wonder if you give us a little sense, because Harlan and I think much more about biomedical innovation and life sciences, medicine, and so on. But it's not just that, it's a lot more. Can you give us a little sense of some of the products that have come out of Yale? Yeah, absolutely. As you point out, I think Yale's, you know, incredibly large and very strong medical school has produced an enormous number of new innovations that often, you know, become new therapeutics, new new vaccines, new medical devices, diagnostics. Um, but as you point out, Howie, we're seeing a, an enormous amount of growth, you know, in other domains across the university as well. So, for example, our School of Engineering and Applied Science is, is growing very rapidly right now, and we're seeing a lot of really incredible research there on artificial intelligence, quantum computing, you know, areas that are going to transform the world fundamentally in the very near future. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of exciting technology spinning out of there. We're also seeing a lot of growth um, related to climate technologies as well. Um, research that's going to help decarbonize our economy and help protect the planet, help address global warming. And so, you know, we're really excited about a lot of the projects. And then, yeah, the, the, the products you're pointing to over my shoulders are often consumer products. Those most commonly are being developed by students or graduates. Um, but there's a, there's a wide range of, uh, of new ideas and innovations coming out of Yale that, that we get to help support. You know, some of the faculty, I'm not going to name them, could be me, the other people, who actually get very enthusiastic about our work, right? And we, we actually think they have wide-ranging potential for impact. We, we, we have dreams of being able to scale them in ways that can help many people, but we're not always right about our own judgments about our work. How does Yale Venture go about evaluating this? Because I would think that you get many more people coming to you saying, hey, I've got something that, you know, I've got cold fusion here. Want to take a look, you know, and, and you're trying to figure out like, because you've got fixed resources, you can't get behind everybody. So how do you sort of, do, on one hand, encourage everyone to be thinking this way, on the other hand, make choices about where you're going to spend your time, where your team's going to spend their time. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a really great question, Harlan, and it's it is one of the most challenging things. I think our approach 
Um, and we've been evolving this over the years. Our approach today is really to try to be as supportive as we can to as many ideas as possible. I, I think it's important that we're very humble uh, in terms of our, uh, our assessment of our ability to predict what's ultimately going to work or not work or have an impact or not at this very early stage. I mean, even the best venture capitalists in the world are wrong nine times out of 10. And so, you know, we're even upstream of them. So I think our job is to be as supportive as we can to as many people and technologies as possible, and then let the science work or not work and let the market decide if it wants to invest or not. But you're right, we do have some programs that have limited resources in terms of, you know, some grant funding and so forth. And so what we do there is we have a number of boards where we bring in independent experts. They're often alumni who work at venture capital firms or work in industry. And, and we bring in their expertise to help judge so that we're not in the position of you know, picking winners and losers amongst our faculty or students, but try to you know, leverage the best thinking from the people you know, out, in, out in industry today. But generally speaking, our philosophy is that we want to be as supportive and, and open uh, as, as we possibly can. And you've already mentioned this, but I want you to explain it a little more broadly. The university actually does quite a lot, both in the silos of the schools as well as in Psy City and through your office to promote and encourage our own students at the undergraduate and graduate level to get involved in innovation very early on. Do you want to give us some examples um, and, and maybe also explain uh, how much you do with social enterprise in addition to sort of the more commercial enterprises? Absolutely. So, you know, at Sci City, we've got an incredibly wide range of programs um, from, you know, very kind of starter entry level types of, of intensives that help people think about how to be innovators, how to solve problems, um, you know, all the way up to supporting students who are starting companies in their dorm rooms and have raised venture capital or generating revenue. And, and we have a number of those. Um, we're also really excited when we run a number of programs and fellowships where we hire students to work on faculty-led ventures as well. Oftentimes there's a need to do market research or to help uh, with analysis or, or um, you know, other work that's helping to get the business off the ground. And we hire a wide variety of students, um, both during the summer, we really swell up, but it, during the academic year as well. Um, who engage in those programs. The students get incredible experiential learning and we get enormous value out of the, the, the support they provide. And as you said, it really covers the whole the spectrum of different new ventures. When we talk about ventures, we're not just talking about, you know, scalable venture investable startups. We're talking about any type of new uh, venture that's looking to do something innovative or solve a problem. And oftentimes that takes the form of nonprofits or arts organizations or community organizations. And we're, we're excited to support all of those. You know, you have such a broad mandate. I, I, I'm only just trying to imagine when you interviewed for this job, you know, it's sort of like, you, you want me to do this and this and this and this and this, like it, it, it's <laughs> such, a, such a, a, a wide range of things. How did, how did, now you're a year in, you know, how does Yale Ventures measure the success of its programs and service? Because it's not, I would think, just simply on, you know, return on investment. It, it's more culture and so forth. So, so do you have any sort of examples of the kind of metrics you're using that at the end of a year you're trying to see to evaluate the impact of the program and both on Yale innovators as well as the broader community? Absolutely. So Yaleys will know we have this saying for God, for country and for Yale. Um, it's uh, usually on banners that go on people's dorm room walls and stuff. It's the last line in the in the fight song, I think. But um, it's it's really about that. I'll, I'll go in reverse order. So for Yale, you know, the, the impact is really when we when we do a good job, we make Yale an incredible place that faculty want to come and they want to stay because they know they're going to be supported if they want to innovate. They want to see their, their research translated for the benefit of society. And same for students, right? So increasingly students want to go to a place that will support innovation, entrepreneurship. So, you know, it's a very important, uh, you know, service to Yale as a university. Um, you know, for country, maybe it's a little less for country, maybe more for the state, for the state of Connecticut. There's a really important economic development aspect to this is we spin out companies. Those companies increasingly, you know, are based here in New Haven. They grow, they create jobs, they import capital from all around the world that gets reinvested back out into the community. It fuels real estate development and, you know, just generally um, helps support the local ecosystem. So there's huge benefits there. And then, you know, for God, I don't, I don't know about God, but, you know, you think about some of the problems that, you know, our, our researchers are working on solving. I mean, we are improving human health, we're curing diseases, we're 
um, you know, creating new ways to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. I mean, things that seem a little bit, uh, you know, out there oftentimes, but, you know, our, you know, our incredible faculty are, are you know, hot on the trail of, of some incredible breakthroughs and have already delivered so many in ways that will, you know, profoundly impact the world we live in in such a positive way. So it's, it's a wide variety of metrics that we measure, um, but they all come together to help those, those different components. So as I mentioned in the intro, you're a, a twice graduated Yale uh, student. Uh, you, you came here for Yale College and you then went to the School of Management. And the School of Management is foundationally built on this idea of, of serving business and society, which is very much what you just described as part of what your mission is here. But I would wonder if you would give us a little reflection on when you look back to what you did in those two years at the School of Management, what coursework, what teachers sort of got you enthusiastic about the types of work that you've done during your career and now? Oh my gosh, there's so many. Yeah, school management is such an incredible place and there's there's so many. I, I, I shouldn't start naming them because I'll, I'll leave yeah, out no, ones that were <laughs> incredibly impactful. You know, the, the irony, I think, and I, I know from a lot of my classmates feel the same way, is that actually some of the classes that we felt were the, the least exciting that were kind of the mandated curriculum have turned out to be some of the most useful like accounting and microeconomics you know things that are incredibly important languages of business and, and that you know are fundamental to so much of what we've done but i think what you're alluding to also howie is the the kind of the the core values of the yale school of management which yes. are about solving problems in business and society and you know i am proud to be one of the many alums who've pivoted back and forth across different sectors over my career and you know hopefully you know made a difference across uh, many areas you know there's some people who bemoan the introduction of business into academia but i really see it as an ability to scale i mean to actually see the impact of the ideas get all the way because unless you're working together with a sustainable enterprise you're not going to see the end product and value of the work that's done. And, and to me, it, it is a very important potential part of a portfolio of work that someone could do. I wonder if we should start thinking about this in the promotion process, which is, you know, I'm just now thinking about medical school, which is as people sort of show their portfolio of work, part of it is what do you, what have you done to ensure its ultimate translation? And I mean, are you working in ways to see it, it, it obviously manifesting itself? Do you think we could get to a place where people actually got credit in the promotion process for working with Yale Ventures and ensuring that good ideas that they've had actually get a chance to get all the way to the marketplace? Yeah, I, th I think the trends are moving in that direction, Harlan. I mean, I think it's all within balance, right? I mean, I think the core mission of the university around research and teaching, you know, always has to be paramount. But I do think, you know, at the department level, at the school level, where those types of decisions are made about you know, what's evaluated in the promotion process. I, I think we are starting to see that, you know, those types of factors uh, included, uh, maybe not overweighting other things, but starting to be part of the discussion and, and assessed in a positive way. I think we're seeing some of our peers uh, start to do that in a more more systematic way. And I hope I hope that's true, because I think the things you said are, are very true. I mean, I think we have an incredible opportunity and maybe responsibility to take the discoveries that are being generated in the billion dollars a year in research that's being invested here and and try to make sure we're doing everything we possibly can to see those discoveries have as big an impact in the world yeah, as possible. And just guard against the conflicts of interest and be able to ensure the integrity of the science, but that that last step is, is important, yeah. Absolutely. So I wanted to touch on that actually, what, what Harlan just brought up, and that is you and I sit on the conflict of interest committee for the university. Um, and, and you play a very special role working within the provost's office to help manage this level of complexity, the, the, the legitimate conflicts that exist and even the perceived conflicts that exist. Can, can you give our listeners a little bit of an idea about why this is, why this is a big challenge for a university to make sure that we're able to uh, protect the science that goes on here from the potential of capitalism, but at the same time help innovate and ensure commercialization of useful products? Yeah, it, it is a very important topic um, for many reasons. You, you just touched on a, a number of them. Um, but I, I do think, you know, as we as we think about managing those conflicts, you know, the good news is that there's, you know, very established policies, 
you know, there's, there's, um, you know, as you said, there's committees that review the kind of edge cases that are, that are, you know, need some special attention. But I think the most important thing is that um, in the end, it, it, it all, the whole system works on, you know, largely on trust and on people who want to do the right thing. And, and I, in my, ex, my experience, you know, being on the committee for a year now is that, you know, our, our faculty want to do the right thing and they don't want to create, you know, the, the a real or even perceived conflict and they want to bend over backwards to make sure that doesn't happen so that, um, you know, the partnership in that process is very strong. I'm sure you see that all the time. And I, I think it's an area where, you know, it's, it's a, often you deal with some pretty challenging circumstances, but I think we, you know, like most of our peers, I think figured out how to do it and do it well. Yeah, yeah, no, I will just add, I'll just add that I, that committee is a rigorous committee. I mean, it's a time consuming enterprise, but I, I wouldn't participate in it if I didn't think it was meaningful. And what you said is right. The university takes this very seriously. As we get to the end of, of, of this part of the podcast, I just wanted to end, Josh, with, with saying, you know, one thing I've noticed about you that is really great is, you know, you've become a person lots of people are coming to advice you know, for. And then you're able to handle that in, in ways that are encouraging but realistic. You know, you're able to help, like you said, balance people's expectations about what's possible, but also to inspire them to think about what they can accomplish. And I've heard that from people who come and talk to you. And, and I think it's an important role that you're playing here now. I just wonder if you could give people who are listening kind of a glimpse of what a conversation like that might go, where somebody comes to you, they've got an idea. It's not a clear slam dunk idea. It's an idea that's fledgling, but could potentially, you're not sure. And that person's a little tentative and just doesn't really quite know you know, whether it's even worth or would it be embarrassing to push this through or, or is it possible to spend some time on this? What, 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 what would they hear from you? Would they sit down with you and say, you know, what, what, do you think of the, what do you think of what I'm talking about and what should I do? Yeah, it's a, it's a well, thank you for the comments. First of all, it's I do feel like I have the best job at the university. I'm sure there's a lot of people that feel that way. But, you know, the fact that I get to, you know, meet all these incredible scholars and students and, and uh, try to be helpful in some small way is such an honor and so much fun. Um, I, I think, Harlan, it, it, you know, most commonly, it's just asking questions, right? It's kind of, um, you know, kind of probing at the idea from the perspective of, you know, maybe somebody from who's spent most of my career in industry, right, or in the private sector and, and thinking about, you know, how it would be evaluated by an investor or, you know, and ultimately that comes down to, you know, what problem are we trying to solve? And is there going to be, you know, demand for, you know, helping to, you know, invest in a solution that's solving that problem, or is it too small or too niche? And if it is, that that means we maybe doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't work on it, because it still could be a very important thing to solve. But it just may need, it needs to go a different route, because it's not we're not gearing up for venture capital financing at that point. So it's, it's really just trying to flesh out and help the entrepreneur, um, you know, understand the types of questions that they'll likely face so that we can work together on you know, the answers to those questions that give them the best position to see their life's work, which is often this discovery that they're bringing forward, you know, have its full potential in the world. Yeah, I love that. What what problem are you trying to solve, you know, the, as a starting point for that, that conversation? Sorry, Howard, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to echo what, what Harlan said and just thank you for what you've done. And to also add that, you know, I've sent several people to you and I know you meet with an awful lot of people who are just looking for career advice that are just looking to see what their place in the world is. And you've just been a very generous mentor, role model, advisor to so many people. And uh, it is what makes you all great to have people like you. And uh, I personally appreciate you a lot. Yeah, thanks. Paul. Well, listen, right back at you guys. There's 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 very few people who are more sought after mentors and more generous with their time than than Howie and Harlan. So, um, you know, you guys set you set the example that many of the rest of us try to emulate. Thanks very much, Josh, for joining us today, and we look forward to having you back soon. Because honestly, this field of innovation is always innovating. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Josh. Anytime. Well, Howie, that was a really terrific interview with Josh. I I, I can't tell you uh, how fortunate we are to have him here. And really, how many good things he's done to kind of spark yes. spark the intellectual aspects of Yale, thinking about how we can bridge from theory and, and discovery all the way to application and, and a benefit for large-scale populations and do it through th this mechanism. But let's get to this part of the uh, podcast part I really like, which is to hear your thoughts. What's on your mind this week? Yeah, so while we're actually taping this segment, the FDA Non-Prescription Drugs Advisory Committee and the Obstetrics, Reproductive, and Urolo 
Urologic Drugs Advisory Committee are in their second day of meeting to consider the approval for non-prescription use, meaning over-the-counter use, of a progestin oral contraceptive pill in the form of Norgestrel, which is being marketed as Opil. So I'll call it Opil going forward because that's what the company wants to call it. And I could not do justice to the issues that are being discussed. I, I assure our listeners, there's a lot to talk about. It's a full two-day meeting. An enormous amount of data is being shared. A 130-page document from the FDA alone and 10 other lengthy documents are posted publicly on the FDA website that addresses the major issues that the committee is considering, and we'll link that to our website. But what I want is to help our listeners understand why and when a drug moves to non-prescription status, and because it is probably, in my opinion, at least not that obvious to most people. So first is background. It's worth pointing out that ibuprofen and cetirizine, which is Zyrtec, and a host of other drugs that we've just come to accept as being over-the-counter started out as prescription-only drugs. You could only get them when a doctor wrote a prescription for you. Ibuprofen was originally approved in the U.S. in 1974 and then converted to over-the-counter use in 1984, so 10 years later. In the case we're talking about now, this drug is being reviewed 50 years after its original approval as a prescription drug. The point being that moving to non-prescription status is rarely as newsmaking as this one seems to be. So what are the characteristics of over-the-counter drugs? So quickly, one, their benefits outweigh their risks. Two, potential for misuse and abuse are low. Three, consumers can use them for self-diagnosed conditions. Four, they can be adequately labeled. And five, Health practitioners are not needed for the safe and effective use of the product. So safe and effective is a common theme when we're talking about review by the FDA. And we could spend a lot of time talking about why drug companies often have had strong incentives to prevent branded but patent-protected drugs from moving over the counter. But the biggest one that people should be aware of is that insurance will generally cover a prescription drug and generally will not cover over-the-counter products, right? In my own course, I like to prompt our students to consider why we even have prescriptions at all. Because in my extreme opinion, and this is mostly for provocation, but in my extreme opinion, with the exception of controlled substances and antibiotics, I can make a pretty good case for allowing patients to have much freer access to drugs without requiring continued visits to doctors or other providers. I certainly don't think the extreme case is feasible, even though I provoke people with that idea uh, for reasons that include the shock to consumers in terms of payments out of pocket and so on. But we should think more about why we require patients to have to visit or otherwise reach out to clinicians at some interval for drugs that in many cases they've safely taken for years or decades, or even when they begin a new drug, when they have carefully considered their personal health and the risks and benefits of treatment. So in the OPIL oral contraceptive case, there's a lot of attention that comes from many different groups. There's concern that individuals will not heed the warnings about safety, that they will not fully understand the effectiveness and how to use these medications, and that we don't have enough real-world data on the use in adolescents, in obese populations, and in those with other comorbid conditions. We also might not have optimized the labeling of the current product to minimize harm and maximize effectiveness. I think it goes without saying that there are some, I think it's a small group, who are opposed to the approval merely because they don't want women to have broader access to contraceptives. But it's worth knowing that we already have a host of over-the-counter medications that are considered safe by so many and yet have rather serious risks. Tylenol, acetaminophen, is the most common cause of liver transplantation in the U.S. and the cause of over 500 deaths annually due to overdosage, only half of these being uh, intentional, right? And overdosage with Tylenol happens inadvertently in many individuals because it's an ingredient in multiple products. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, including ibuprofen, have been repeatedly shown to increase risk of acute and ongoing kidney injury in those who take it, 
even in the normal daily dosing recommendations, generally due to other physiologic or medical conditions or for those who take it chronically. So in summary, I think OPIL will eventually be approved. Sometimes people are saying by the summer, uh, and I hope that we can learn more and then revise the labeling and help consumers understand the best use uh, of this and other products. But just as importantly, I think we should be reconsidering how we manage the over-the-counter drug uh, approval process and continued access, because there are millions of individuals who don't have easy access to clinicians, and, and being able to gain access to drugs or continue to be able to fill prescriptions is vitally important. You know, that's really good good points, How You're such a good teacher. You know, you sort of really draw analogy to other s- situations. By the way, in the ac- acetaminophen, do, do you mean drug caused liver transplantation. I would have thought alcohol was the number one cause. Of- I thought so too, Harlan. I, I looked this up twice, apparently for, may, maybe it's in the acute phase, but it's liver transplantation. We do 500 for acetaminophen alone every that year. That is wild. I, di- I didn't realize that. Yeah. You, you know, and I, I, I'll tell you something else. Well, you know, I'm a big advocate for for patient empowerment, people being able to make their choice. I think we we infantilize our patients. We, we make it seem like they're unable to make choices. But, you know, another example is, you know, we get broad access to other drugs like alcohol, you know, I mean, people do yeah. it for recreational purposes, but, but, you know, this has risk. People have to make decisions. Sometimes they make good decisions. Sometimes they may not make good decisions, but it, we allow people to make decisions. Nicotine, we allow people to make decisions. Yes. I mean, you, you know, really, where do you draw the line about it is unsafe, sufficiently unsafe that we are going to require people to have someone else to give them permission to take it. And, and this thing about the insurance company covering it is huge. You know, now what will that mean? Are we actually going to have insurance companies backing this because now they want to have women be responsible for, for purchasing their own oral contraceptives? So people are concerned about that. Yeah, yep, so it is a concern. Th- this is a very important area is very important. And you know, I've told you before, like, why not make statins, you know, something that anybody can go get if they want to reduce their risk of heart disease. And if it seems appropriate, they should be doing it in, in consultation with doctors. And But but to have that be the gatekeeping, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway. If I'm not mistaken, you may be able to remind me better, but I think our uh, colleague, um, Mary Tonetti, wrote a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine maybe 10 or more years ago advocating for simvastatin or maybe one of the other statins going over the counter. And I'm shocked that it hasn't happened yeah. over time. I don't remember that particularly, maybe, but I do remember we came to the brink of uh, the FDA making a decision in that direction, and then they they backed off. But yeah, no, this may be a, a really good case to to see uh, set precedent for the for the future for these kind of meds. Well, anyway, thanks very much for raising. I, th- I think it's a really really important point. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Krumholtz and Howie Foreman. So, how did we do? To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at H-M-K-Y-A-L-E. That's H-M-K-Y-A-L. And I'm at the Howie. That's at T-H-E-H-O-W-I-E. You can also email us at health.veritas at yale.edu. Aside from Twitter and our podcast, I'm fortunate to be the faculty director of the healthcare track and founder of the MBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management. Feel free to reach out via email for more information on our innovative programs, or you can check out our website at som.yale.edu slash EMBA. Health and Veritas is produced with the Yale School of Management and now the Yale School of Public Health. And I'm going to stop saying now because they're just another sponsor of ours now, so it's not even new. Thanks to our researcher, Inez Gil, and to our producer, Miranda Schaefer. They are absolutely amazing. They make this podcast what it is. Talk to you soon, Howie. Thanks very much, Harlan. Talk to you soon.